Hi everyone, uh, welcome, uh, thank you for joining. Uh, just before we go even further, if you can just um, put some comments, if you can be able to hear me, if you can just put on the chat section. Oh. Thanks Gary, thanks Peter, thanks Philip. Um, so welcome to our session today. Um, just before we kick things off, uh, <clears throat> I just want to quickly uh, take you over through this. So if you can just uh, ensure that you uh, disable all the notifications uh, before we start. So it does not uh, interrupt you when you're trying to watch the session. All right, uh, my name is Perry from uh, EIT, Engineering Institute of Technology, I'm based in the South African office. Um, welcome to our topic today's uh, introduction to subsea technology. This will be presented by <clears throat> our lecture, De Jeremiah. Um, yeah, but just before I uh, hand it over to him, I just want to quickly run a few common questions. Um, so just know that we do provide copy of uh, slides and the video of, um, of this session. So we should be sending that to your email in the next uh, two business days. So just ensure that you keep an eye on your emails. And then another one is um, <clears throat> we provide certificate of attendance. I will be providing you with the QR code or um, a scanner uh, or a link that you need to follow in order to uh, retrieve um, or request a certificate of attendance. Just know that we provide the certificate in the next uh, four days after this session. All right, so just for those who are joining us for the first time, just the, you know an overview about who we are. Uh, EIT, when you think of EIT, think engineering. We are specialists in engineering. You'll see we have our professional programs, uh, advanced diplomas, diplomas, undergraduates, graduate certificate, uh, bachelors and masters. And then our highest level of qualification is um, doctor of engineering. Um, yes, we are industry orientated, as uh, most of you can agree with me that that time to time, you know, technology is changing, the industry is changing. So at EIT, we ensure that, um, you know, our materials together with our resources are up to date just to ensure that we're keeping up with the trends and what we are teaching to our students is actually uh, relevant to the industry. Um, we are just like any higher education provider in Australia, we are created with Australian government. Uh, we also have some of our programs that are recognized that under three international accords. So you'll get our advanced diplomas under Dublin Accord. Uh, you get our bachelors under Sydney, and then you get our masters under Washington Accords. And yes, we source our lectures from different parts of the globe. Uh, we very unique method when coming to uh, studies. Uh, we have uh, interactive uh, webinars, we do have um, remote labs and simulations uh, that our students um, use. Um, yeah, I will now hand it over to Mr. Jeremiah. Uh, Mr. Jeremiah, you can take it away, sir. Thank you. Yeah, um... Well, that's a good morning or good afternoon or good evening from wherever you are joining. I believe, please let me know if you are hearing me clearly. Can you just chat in the box if you are hearing me clearly? Yeah, can you please? Oh, good, good. So thanks, Barry, for the time and for the introduction of what we do at AIT. And my name is Dari Jeremiah, and I have over 20 years experience in the oil and gas specializing in subsea system design. So we have some valuable experience. So without wasting much time, we go straight into our slide. So the agenda for today, just a brief introduction of subsea. 
So we want to look at the brief introduction of the to the oil and gas industry. We look at what subsea is all about. Why do we need subsea development? And we look at some of the drivers for subsea system. Then we look at the subsea field development. Uh, what what comes to our mind when we are supposed to develop a subsea field? And then we now look at different equipment, different component of subsea system. And I believe in the next couple of 40 minutes, I should be able to turn you to a subsea engineer. So please just sit down and relax. Now, what is the expectation? Now, they want to just gain some complete overview of subsea production equipment and systems. So by the time you leave this place today, in the next less than one hour, you will know some of the subsea terminologies. You will understand some drivers. Why do we go into subsea system? Then you understand when we are talking of deep water and shallow water development, and then you learn about some structures and equipment that are involved. We call it subsea components. When we look at oil and gas industry, it can be divided into three categories. So that's why I want to take you from the basis. We have the downstream sector, we have the midstream sector, we have the upstream sector, or rather let me rearrange it again. We have the upstream sector where it's about exploration and production, drilling, seismic, getting the oil out, the crude oil or the crude gas. And then the midstream is about the transportation, the processing and the storage of what we have gotten out from the upstream. And then we now move to the downstream. That's where many of us we are conversant with, where your gas stations, your refineries, your distribution, and of course, aviation industry, all the things you use the fuel for after you have refined it, that is downstream sector. So your popular mobile gas station, Chevron gas station, uh, Egypt gas station, that is downstream. And the refinery is part of downstream. But when you're talking of the storage of the crude oil, like the oil, uh, oil fuel tanker, th that is that, uh, midstream. So if you understand that now, our area of focus is now on the upstream. Now the upstream can now be further divided. So uh, this is what I've just explained. The upstream, we have the onshore, we have the offshore. So, and then the midstream and then the downstream. So now this upstream that we are focusing on is further divided into different kind of regions when we talk of operations. We have the onshore, we have the offshore, we have the subsea. Now, when you look at subsea, it can be a subcategory of offshore. So we have onshore, we have offshore and subsea. So when you're talking of onshore food production, what does that mean? That's where you have the land or you are getting it in the swamp area, in the river area. So that is onshore. Now, offshore, we have the offshore, which can be divided into offshore production and subsea production. So are you seeing the picture? Somebody said no pictures. So the subsea production. So now, when you look at the offshore, what differentiates the subsea from... Okay, good. The what differentiate them from offshore, the subsea, that's our mirror area of focus today. So I will just tell you when you that means it's not all offshore are subsea. At the same time, all offshore are offshore, but not all are subsea. What make it subsea? That's what we're going to do next now. What is subsea system? Why do we call some certain part of production at offshore a subsea? Now, a subsea system is a production system whose Christmas tree. Now, the Christmas tree, another name for it is production tree, are located below the water surface and tied back to the fixed floating or onshore host facility. What does that mean is that we have the onshore tree, which is production tree at the onshore production. And when we have offshore tree, which I call it surface tree. This surface tree, they are located at the platform on top of the water. Now, the moment the production tree, which is the Christmas tree, is located beneath the water surface, and is that is it does what we call a wet tree, that makes it subsea. So I believe I'm able to differentiate it now. So when you see when you say offshore production, 
offshore production, we have the subsea production, we have the normal surface tree production. That is the normal platform. You see people going to the offshore, the uh, uh, offshore platform. But when you're talking of the subsea, the Christmas tree is located on the seabed. That's inside the way. Uh, it is, it is, it is, that's inside the water. For example, we have the subsea satellite back in the north of Mexico. We have uh, FPSO like Bonga in Nigeria, Nakika, Omenland in Norway. So that is what separates So anybody that asks a question, I say, oh, you are talking of subsea. Why is this subsea? Just simple answer, because the Christmas tree, which is also called production tree, is located inside the water. While the other production field, like tension leg platform, say a fixed platform, they are located on top of the water. So that's why we call it surface Christmas tree. And I said that we call it dry Christmas tree, while the other one is wet Christmas tree. So a subsea production system consists of subsea completed well, seabed well head, subsea production tree, subsea tying to flow line system, subsea equipment and control facility to operate the well. Now, all this information that we have mentioned, all those components that consist, they are all inside the water, on top of, just after before, uh, just on top of the seabed. So it can range in the complexity of single satellite well with a flow line link to a platform or FPSO or onshore facility. For some of you that maybe you don't know FPSO, FPSO means floating, uh, floating production storage and offloading. What does that mean? It's a floating vessel, a floating ship that produces at the same time it has a storage like a tanker inside the vessel and it can offload to another uh, oil tanker. So the production now has some processing facility to separate the oil gas from the oil, the sand from the gas that do a proper separation before now transferring it to the oil tanker. So that's FPSO, but we should talk about it. So what are the components, which we are still going to talk about, that's going to be the last part of our lecture. The subsea drilling system, so everything is done on subsea. We have the subsea Christmas tree and the well led system. We have the umbilical and reser system. We have the subsea manifold and jumper system. We have the tying and flow line system. We have the control system and we have the subsea installation. So the, uh, all these components, we're going to take them one by one for you to understand it. So this is just the relationship of the component, the pipeline, which I'm going to take them one by one. Now, why do we do subsea development? The first reason is economic reason. Of course, you know, net present value is all about what is the income generated that I'm going to generate. So the production that you have may be a short, it may be within the small vicinity that the, it may not justify the capex for a platform. What is CAPEX? Capital expenditure. What is capital expenditure? That's the expenditure you are going to spend, the money you are going to spend, the fund you are going to spend from the design up to the level that you are going to start producing. That's from the detailed design, the, the, the engineering design, detailed design, procurement, construction, and installation. And then from there, you commission. And then the moment you commission and the first oil come out and you hand over, capex finished. Now, by the time you have just like two, three words, you may not be able to, you may not want to start disturbing yourself building a new platform. So that's why we may go for subsea. Another one is for capex, subsea development that generally less expensive than top side alternative. That's what I've just explained. Then OPEX. What is OPEX? As I explained about capex, capital expenditure stop at after the commission after the commissioning and the first oil come out. Then the opex there's the subsidy value that will require regular maintenance, like topside structure. So opex is operating expenditure. So then another one that we think about is early production. For example, if you want to do a tie back and you have a small field that you want to clean, produce and tie back. So that's why we call it for fast start development is required. You can be thinking of subsidy. 
Then another reason is based on geography. For example, if the field reservoir area may not be reached by diluted drilling from the surface well, and what is the surface well? That's where you use the surface Christmas tree. If the place is not maybe if the distance is too much, it's not like that. It's not the proximity is very far from the uh, surface well. So and then the water depth may be too great to use a surface well platform, which we are still going to talk about. For example, the fixed platform can go up to 550, 520 feet. The tension platform, well, for subsea development like semi submersible and uh, FPSO can go over 3,000 meter water depth. Now, another reason why we think of subsea is where locations are spread around and not supported by dry trees. Where you have a well location, like some well location can be as far as 50, uh, 5 to 10 kilometers or maybe 30 kilometers from the uh, from the dry trees, if I can go to step out up to like 150 kilometers, so that is when you begin to think of subsea. And then lack of nearby processing or receiving facility. For example, in Africa, most of the oil producing countries like Nigeria, Angola, they don't have LNG, they don't have the refinery to pack it up. So based on that, you think of subsea, so that you just offload it and then you take it to offshore uh, international. Then another one, which I've already explained before, small field in close proximity to the existing platform. Why subsea development? Safety. We look at it from the economic point of view. We look at it from the geographic point of view, looking of the water depth and the spread. Safety. The personnel is to man a platform or perform a uh, platform, uh, platform uh, perform maintenance is elevated with subsea option. So like you go to offshore every time, but all this, our equipment that in the other the seabed, no woman being gets there is only being operated by ROV. And the moment you put it there, that's why the design must be accurate, as far as almost accurate and perfect. And more you, more you dump it on the seabed, it's going to be there for like almost 40 years with minimal plan and unplanned repairs. So for safety of personnel, because there are a lot of challenges when you take people to offshore and all those things. So for safety of personnel, we take off subsea again. Then we now look at the advantages of subsea. No visual impact. So where there are economic turmoil or political turmoil, nobody can guess and say, I want to enter water to go and disturb the production. Then when like uh, talk in uh, Russia and in Scandinavian countries where they have a very ice in Arctic conditions, you think of subsea. Then it eliminates capex of platform that is capitalized by digital platform. Then the cost body transfer from capex to opex is totally reduced because as soon as you design, you install, you procure, you construct, and then you install and commission. So instead of moving the capex again and say, oh, this is what we'll be doing during the OPEX is to reduce drastically. And then we we'll look at the construction cycle. It can be conducive to fast track project. As I've explained, if you have a small proximity, a small field, not too far from an existing platform, you can just use a subsea, do a small subsea tree well, and then connect it with a flow line to an existing platform. And then it's suitable for phase projects. So maybe you have an oil field. And you don't have money to deliver to, to 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 develop the whole of you can do it face by face, and those are the advantage. However, the disadvantage to me as a subsea engineer is not a disadvantage to me. See, it's an advantage, and I believe anybody that's going to be a subsea engineer, this is your advantage. It's a complex hardware. Technically, if it is not complex, we will not be needed as a subsea engineer. So I like it to be complex because the more it becomes complex, the more we, the subsea engineer, are very needed. Now, another one is inaccessible for maintenance and repair. That's why subsea engineers are needed. But of course, in terms of cost, is uh, and them of inaccessibility of maintenance and repair, it makes it more disadvantageous. But to me, as a subsea engineer, if it's accessible for maintenance at every time, nobody would look for design engineer again. Then the other one is intervention. If in case you want to intervene, is very expensive and complex. Yes, this is very expensive and complex. And I said, I turn it around and say, if it's not expensive and complex, no subsea engineer will be needed. But it's very expensive because for you to go and intervene, it's complex and you need to get some vessels again. And some vessels can be as costly, intervention vessels can be as costly as 
up to five hundred thousand dollars per day, if no more than that. Now, what are the drivers for the subsidy? We look at why do we go subsidy? We talk of the economy reason, we talk of the geographical reason, like water depth, with proximity of the way to the reservoir, and then we look talk of the safety. I will look at some of the advantages and disadvantages. Now, I want to look at what are the drivers for the subsidy system. The first one is water depth. It is not always technically or and of economically visible to construct structure solutions beyond certain water depth. For example, fixed structures limit is approximately 400 meter water depth. Tension lake platform is approximately 1,000 meter water depth. Spa limit is what is approximately 3,000 meter water depth. Whereas for subsea system with FPSO host, they are visible to approximately 3,000 water depth. And subsea provide ability to locate the host in more technically and economically visible water depth, while still capturing deeper water reserves. So while you are going for the water depth, you still capturing deeper water reserve. So that is why the drivers for subsea, water depth is one of the major drivers. Because you can't use uh, FPS, so you can use it for shallow water too if it is subsea, but FPS can go as far as more than 3,000 water depth and semi submersible so if you look at the picture now, you see the platform, look at as the driver, the water depth is changing. Now, by the time you look at the spa and the FPSO, so this FPSO is more like at the same time, it's the same proportion with the semi submersible semi submersible is just that it doesn't have a storage tank. It doesn't have a process facility, processing facility. So you can look at the spa, you can look at the intention depth platform, you can look at the compliance tower, which is up to 900 meter water depth and fixed platform 400 meter water depth. Yeah, can you hear me very clearly now? Someone said voice is fluctuating. Now, the other issue is subsurface issues. We have looked at the water depth. We now look at the subsurface issues. We have the reservoir drainage, like maybe the area extend too far from, from each one, from one drilling center to another drilling center, the reservoir depth too shallow to reach from one drilling center. The complexity, the well count, when you have like 60 wells, that would have to have been a commotion if you're going to use a dry tree. Then you add the, uh, when you have the uncertainty, there's a need for a phase development. Now, another sub issue, sub surface issue that make us to go for subsea is drilling hazard. For example, we have some shallow water, we have uh, shallow water fault, flow and shallow gas. The subsea system provides flexibility concerning the well location and initial capex. Subsea equipment, subsea equipment is less site specific and can be redeployed in the event of reservoir disappointment or short field of life. For example, FPSO can be moved to another location, but fixed platform cannot be moved to another location. Tension leg platform cannot be moved to another location. SPA cannot be moved to another location, but semi submersible um FPSO, as soon as we discover that there is a need for that because the survival is disappointing, just move it to another location and abandon the well and uh, plug and abandon the well. Then another driver is remote product matter, like as I've explained before, some part in Africa, limited oil or export gas uh, export facility or proximity to market, low local market for oil, e.g. West Africa, Nigeria, or Angola. Gas rejected or probably local energy facility, for example, Nigeria has an energy facility. Now, FPSO with subsurface, subsea system is a good fit where large oil storage and off-road capacity require that by utilizing the oil storage vessel as the host. So that's why when you know that you have a big oil capacity and the reservoir is great, you can put an FPSO there instead of semi submersible instead of the TLP and utilize the storage first before you offload it to the uh, your, um, storage vessel or oil tanker. Another driver is pre-existing facility. There are some structure is thought to exploit large fuel develop 
like APSO, utilizing all leads more economically than building new one. You can just connect to the existing facility, extending the host life. When all age does not exist, expand the existing facility to serve as the host, which is almost cheaper than building a second structure, which we are going to look at it from the tie back at the start alone. Subsea structures uh, are frequently more cost effective than alternative solution when you compare Gulf of Mexico and North Sea and with other regions. So other drivers that's, which allow pre-drilling, completion of the well can be which can reduce the time to first production, unique and environmental issues like iceberg, subsystem are sometimes chosen for other software reason. Favorable fiscal environment to promote indigenous subsidy industry like Norway or in-country content. Safety and sustainable development like Umeland, then avoiding transporting personnel offshore and other environmental issues. So we take us to begin to push towards subsea, then to avoid offshore platform visible from onshore, for example, California. Now, after we have looked at the drivers, we look at the subsea, we already know what subsea is all about. We look at the why you go subsea, we look at it from the economic point of view, from the geographical point of view, from the safety point of view. Then we look at what are the drivers? We look at the water depth, other reasons, and things that can make it. Now, when you say, when you mention the word subsea development, what comes to your mind? How do you develop a subsea field? When you are given, let's say, OML, uh, OML license, TD20, and you are given what first comes to your mind, and all you are part of the a feasibility study of a subsea field. So when you are defining the field architecture, there are following issues that need to be considered. The first thing first, is it a deep water or shallow water development? Now, when it is deep water, it is meant it's beyond diverse reach. If it is shallow water, that means it's within diverse reach. And then after you take it, okay, it's deep water, it's shallow water, you take again, is it going to be dry tree or wet tree? If it is dry tree, it's not fully subsea. But if it is wet tree, it's fully subsea. Then when you are make you, when you make such decision, it will let you know what kind of floating production you are going to use, what kind of platform. If it is dry tree, that means I cannot use FPSO. I cannot use semi-submersible. If it is dry tree, I can use TSLA platform. I can use fixed platform. I can use a uh, compliance tower. And then another thing that comes to your mind is standalone or tie back development. Is it going to be a new field that go to get a new platform, a new floating production that go to get the oil out? Or am I going to do the uh, develop the field instead of getting uh, instead of getting the oil and getting a new platform, a new production system, a new uh, a floating production system, you tie it back to an existing platform. That's the meaning of the standard standalone and tie back. And then we need to look at what is going on. What if my oil or my gas is not producing as expected? What should I do? That's where you begin to take off subsea processing. And that's when you look at the subsea pump, subsea gas compression for gas, subsea injection, subsea water injection. And then we have artificial lift method. And we have what how are you going to do the configuration? Do you need template? What does the well arrangement, the well cluster? What is it going to be satellite well? Are you going to be need manifold, which we are going to talk about all this one as we move on? So as I said, for deep water, when you are thinking of is it going to be deep water or shallow water development? Subsidy can be calculated as going to the water depth, deep water or shallow water. Now, I know we have water deep water. A field is considered to be shallow water if the water depth is less than 200 meters. In practice, shallow water is the depth of a diverse reach. That means where the diverse can reach. And then the second category, according to the water depth, we call it deep water, which ranges between 200 meters and 1,500 meters. And the, one, the, the third one is ultra deep water subsea development. They are those water depth that are greater than 1,500 meter water depth. So we have the shallow water development, we have the subsea development, we have the deep water subsea development, we have ultra deep water subsea development. 
Then you now think of after you have decided, oh, you go to be shallow water. What is the water depth? Water depth is 220. Oh, that's deep water. The water depth is 150. That's shallow water. The water depth is 2,000 meters. Oh, that is ultra deep water. Well, you now begin to think, okay, what kind of tree am I going to use to control my well? Because the purpose of the Christmas tree is to control the well. Is it going to be wet tree or dry tree system? So there are two kinds of subsea production systems used in the tree. We have the dry tree system, we have the wet tree system. Now, the dry tree system are located or close to the platform, like tension layer platforms, sparse, they normally utilize dry tree system. Now, the wet tree system can be anywhere in the field in terms of cluster. So what does that mean that if you have 50 wells, you are going to have 50 wet trees, each on each of the well. And then the Christmas tree and its associated component are exposed to the ambient seabed condition. So that's one thing that, separate, as I said from the beginning of the lecture, what separates the offshore from the subsea is the, because the Christmas tree is exposed to the ambient seabed condition, is placed on the seabed, is inside the water. So this is just a typical surface Christmas tree, the one on the blue and the one just the clear wet Christmas tree the picture. So now I talk of subsea type back and stand alone. When you are developing a field, you look at it that do I go for a standalone development or should I tie back to existing? When you look at these two pictures here, we have two fields, the green part, the light green and the light purple. Now, instead of this, the existing platform, the blue or the green part, now the purple one is the new discovery. But instead of them to tie it back to the existing one, they made it a standalone discovery. That is standalone, that made this call it a standalone subsea development. Now, when you look at the other one now, you can see that they did not use any, they did not put any FPSO here. They just used a 30 kilometer pipeline and tie it back to the existing. And tie it back to the existing. So that is to tell you what. A standalone development and this tie back development is all about. And then you now look at what kind of installation am I going to use? What is going to be the host? When you're talking of host, you're talking of the platform. So we have two category type of installations. We have the mobile unit, we have the fixed installation. When you're talking of mobile unit like FPSO, semi or massive, this can be moved from one location to another, either by towing or on their own. If it is semi or massive, it's going to be by towing. If it is semi uh, FPSO, it's going to move on their own. And it can be any position using anchor or a dynamic positioning system. So we talk about, for example, we have semi or massive, drill shift, jack of badges of FPSO. And we have fixed installation that you cannot move it. Incapable of movement on their own designed to be moved for initial placement and post-production disposal, like Christmas tree or fixed platform. So these are two major types of installations where you're talking of offshore installation. We have the mobile unit, we have the fixed unit. Now, what are the subsidies, what are the structures do we need? We are talking of host. We have various kinds of offshore uh, platform. We have the fixed platform. We have the compliance towers. We have the FPSO. We have the tension leg platform. We have the service or massable. We have this pass. But when you're talking of subsidy development, what are the things that give guide us on what to choose? We limit it to these four choices for deep water. Tension depth platform can go up to 1,500 meter water depth. Semi submersible can go up to 3,000. Spa can go up to 3,000. And FPSO can go up to 3,000. So when you are making a choice of the acceptable floating production solution, you think of many years of operating history used for a large variety of function like it can be used for both wet tree and dry tree scalable maybe the west side the top side can be the payload can you can remove it and it's applicable worldwide now what we'll take us the component of subsea system we have looked at the top side now we have looked at we have four major type of top side we have five the fixed platform is there but i'll just look at spa Semitation deck platform, semi submersible, and FPSO. So those are different kind of host. We call it host facility that is hosting everything that is under the seabed. 
Now I want to look at, I want to go on a journey in this our little time that's remaining, so that you have the feel or the basic understanding of what subsequent component is all about. If you look at this drawing here now, you see the one at the top, which is uh, the PF PSO there now. It can be semi submersible it can be tap to the spa. Now, if you look at all this equipment, starting from the well to the Christmas tree, to the well jumper, to the manifold, to the so, uh, flow line jumper, to the plate, to the pipeline, to the riser. And from the riser, you see, you, from this place, you see the umbilical coming up to umbilical termination assembly. So we are going to now look at all those components one by one. When you drill a well, the first thing that is in contact with the well, it, we call it subsea well head. It's a major component in the subsea production system. Now, what is the what is the well head? Subsea well head is the interface between the subsurface equipment, like the downhole, and the surface equipment. What are the surface equipment? The Christmas tree, the blow preventer, the flow line, the host. So the first interface, the first component that is on the seabed that has contact with the subsea well, we call it subsea well head. So what is the purpose of this subsea well head? It's to suppose, support the blood preventer, the BOP, and see the well during drilling, support and see the production tree, subsea production tree, that's Christmas tree. It support and see the tubing anger for conventional subsea Christmas tree, which uh, we are talking of tubing anger is the one that is like you are using, going through it for any, um, uh, or, or we want to do some testing, we want to do injection, inhibition, it goes to the tubing anger. And the tubing anger is like the control line that comes from the Christmas tree to the well, to the well through the um, uh, subsea tree. Now, if you look at the subsea well head assembly now, this tubing head spool, this is where the well, the subsea well head is sitting, is inside it. So the tubing head spool is like a flow base, is like a guard. We call it the guard lines or guardliness for the for the bit for the uh, well head. And then this is the tubing anger. And then we have the subsea Christmas tree. And we have the tree cap. So this is just a complete subsea well head assembly and the Christmas tree. And each well for the subsea is actually utilizing all these components. So as I said, the, 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 guard, the guard lines and the flow base. So most well that they use permanent guard base that often support the guard post, guard lines are attached to the guard. So this you can see the well head there. So and for the interface of the tree and the uh, pipeline. So it can be called flow base or uh, tubing air spool. Like this one now, this is a garden air permanent guard base. This is for deep water. So now this one and the one I showed you before, one is called flow base, other one is called well head guard base or guardliness or tubing air spool. They all do the same thing just to protect the well head. If you look at this picture now, you can see the well head inside the, the funnel type, which is we already use for easy installation on deep water. Now, the next one is tubing anger. Tubing anger, it supports the downhole tubing in the well. You see the analogs at the top of the well and provide access to the downhole equipment. So you look at the tubing anger, if you look at it now, it's the one that actually support the downhole, they do all the next intervention through the tubing anger. It's between the Christmas tree and the uh, depending on the pattern of Christmas tree you're using, if you're using conventional Christmas tree, it's going to be between the Christmas tree inside the well head. If you're using the horizontal, it's inside the Christmas tree. Now, we now take us, you know, we, have, we are taking it from step by step. We have taken the, we have seen the well head, the tubing anger. Now it's the Christmas tree. And don't forget that this Christmas tree is what are they called, what, what made it subsea. So a control tree, a, a production tree. So it's a set of valve and piping to allow the control of a well during production at the mud line and remote to the host facility. That's why it's called production tree. It controls the well. 
So we have different kind of Christmas tree. If you look at the one when uh, this is the onshore Christmas tree, this is offshore. The red one is offshore Christmas tree, which can be referred to as probably the dry tree. And we have a subsea Christmas tree. Now, for subsea Christmas tree, we have this. We are more than We have different types. We have conventional tree, which another name for conventional tree is vertical Christmas tree. We have horizontal Christmas tree, which another name for it is pool tree. Now, when you look at the onshore Christmas tree, the surface tree, and the Christmas tree subsea, you can see that it's much more complex, it's larger, it's more robust, more expensive, and of course, inaccessible. You can see this one, someone can assess it and come and do whatever he wants to do inside. Then after we have looked at all these components we have gone through, then we see something called manifold. Because the subsea Christmas tree that you have looked at is subsea well assembly at the Christmas tree is just for one well. What if you have like 50 wells scattered around, like in a cluster or in a satellite? How do we commingle it to go to the old? You cannot connect pipeline to each of the 50 wells to the shore. So that's where we need manifold. And what is manifold? Manifold is a collection of valve and piping. It collects flow from multiple wells into a single transportation system. It provides economy to to individual flow lines, I've explained. Distribution point for chemicals, gas for gas leaf to Christmas tree. It can allow for isolation of one Christmas tree from others. For example, if you want to do intervention on one Christmas tree, you only touch that one and just close the valve from the manifold that is connecting it, and you continue producing in other wells. It, allow, it can allow piggy for flow line and designed to take expansion load from the flow line to, or, and provide protection from impact. So, so if, if you look at the gooseneck on this program, that is for the purpose of expansion. So this is the manifold. If you look at the wedge, this is the manifold in the middle. And we have different type of manifold. Look at the manifold. You can see the head, look at the Christmas tree, one, two, three, four, five. Look at the manifold that is connecting the five of them and now channel them to two pipelines. So we have different type of manifold. We have template manifold. We have cluster manifold. We have large gathering manifold and we have hybrid manifolds. Now, if you look at, I just jump from Christmas tree to the manifold. Now, what connects the Christmas tree and the manifold? You have like five Christmas tree. That is where we have what we call a tying system. We have looked at the manifold solution. Now let's look at how we typically connect the wells at the flow line to our manifold or flow line directly to the wells. This has to be typically done by use of jumper. We call this pool. So we are going to look at it. So if you look at this jumper now, this is this is a purpose bridge convolution of pipe and connector. Typically, this convolution combined with can either be flexible or rigid, and it can be either be horizontally or vertically configured connectors into jumpers or spools. So these are different kind of tools. We have the well jumper, we have the flow line jumpers. So look at the, uh, if you look at this jumper now, this is a, uh, this is a special spool. So now take us to, after we have connected the manifold and the Christmas tree with the jumper. So we now know manifold, there's manifold, there's Christmas tree, there's jumper. But how can our oil get to the host? That's the use of riser, flow line and terminations. So we are producing from one side and you connect it from the Christmas tree to the manifold. And then from the manifold, where does it go? It goes to what we call a termination. That's pipeline and manifold or pipeline and termination, plate or plate. So if it is called plate, if it is only one pipeline that is connecting and it's called plane, if it's connecting more than two pipelines, two or more pipelines. And then we have riser, that's the organizer. So we take them one by one. So what is risers? Risers are just a conduit between the subsystem on the seabed and the production control unit. So if you have the FPSO at the top and then the oil is coming. So the hanging pipeline is what is called riser. 
And the risers can be divided, you have been classified into very different kind of uh, meaning, for example, based on the functions. If you are using the drilling riser or a completion or work over risers or production or injection riser. And also, when it can, it can be called uh, export risers, maybe for the purpose of moving the oil, that's for pre production riser. That's breaking it down to our upstream we are talking about. Based on construction, is it compliance riser? Is it top tension riser or hybrid riser? When you talk of compliant riser, that is compliant with the movement of the sea, like stick catenary riser, like lazy wave riser, uh, flexible risers. Those are what we call compliant riser. And then we have top tension riser, which is like a drill riser that just goes straight from the seabed to the upside. And we have hybrid. Hybrid riser is hybrid, uh, connecting both compliance riser and, and uh, top tension riser. That's why we call it hybrid. And it can be based on material type. It can either be rigid or flexible. So this is just different kind of risers that I've explained. Then we're talking about pipeline now. A pipeline is a transport system for oil, gas, and water, or other fluids. We have onshore pipeline, we have offshore pipeline, which is called subsea. And it can be further divided into two types. We have the infield pipeline, we call it flow line. We have the export pipeline, we call it trunk lines or export lines. So in the infield, infield pipeline, they are limited in size. They just typically range from three to 16 inch. The length is for it can be from a few hundred kilometers to 10 of kilometer is for within the operation within the field. And the infield pipeline can be oil production pipeline, gas production pipeline, water injection pipeline, gas injection lines, service line, other glycol lines, or maybe abitol lines. So we can use it because it's within the field. Whereas export line, they transport uh, fluid from platform to shore, or from shore to shore, let's say from UK to Norway, from Australia to, <coughs> to Singapore, or from Perth to Melbourne. So as I said, export line transport from shore to shore or platform to shore, the diameter can be up to 60, inch, 60 inches. Length of the cell can range from some kilometer to several hundred of kilometer. Most export line transport guys, but also export lines are oil export lines are common too. So the plan, as I've explained, plate plan. It requires substructure for pipe to pipe connection. It provides support for the connection point. The plane, it simply means it's connecting for region and other sources such as manifold, clay, and it's more than uh, from, from pipeline to substructure. And it is called plate, where serving as a support for one pipeline valve and one connector. While plane is supporting, is supporting two or more pipeline connections. So this is the word I've just shown you now. If you look at it now, we've, we've done the well -heads, we have done the Christmas tree, we have done move it, do the jumper, this is a flexible jumper. We have looked at the manifold, we can look at the flow line jumper, we have looked at the plane, and we've got we've look at the flow line, we we'll look at the riser. But now, how do you control? Your system safely, efficiently, and minimizing shutdown while minimizing time production level, you need to be in control of your words. That's where a subsidy control is required. So, why what is subsidy control? The subsidy production control system performs the valve control, data monitoring required to operate the subsidy field facility. The subsea control system interfaces with topside and subsea facility and involve many different engineering disciplines. So what does it do if you look at to control, to remote this operating valve, to choke valve, choke valve, ball valve, monitor and collect data from the subsea uh, sensor, electrical communication and fiber optics. And we use umbilical to deliver chemicals, to deliver power to the subsea system, to interface the host 
and the onshore and probably the platform and the FPSO. So if you look at this drawing now, these are the, our subsea control layout. Everything we have the plat the unit at the top side or on the shore, and it goes from an oblique through an oblique to the subsea. And when it goes to the subsea, it enters the oblique termination assembly or from there to subsea distribution unit, and it goes to different kind of component that it wants. So that actually controls the way. So we have oblique termination arrangement. That's where it interface between the oblique and the subsea control. So which that's where the umbilical comes from the top side and it enter the termination and from the terminations it enter to other subsea well with the call we call that one uh, flying leads. So this is just uh, if you have time you can just go to um, just go to go uh, YouTube and just type any subsea field you and just watch uh, some of those field and then. You'll be able to understand more. So thank you. Questions. So question I hand over to Barry. So in case there any question. All right. Um, thank, you. thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Jeremiah. I'm just checking if there's any questions. Um, Nothing at the moment. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm just going to quickly uh, jump into um, these are just uh, upcoming webinars. So I mean, courses. Uh, so if you are interested in um, to read more about our programs, you can go on our website and just check under course schedule to see our upcoming programs. Um, yeah, these are the upcoming webinars. So yeah, you can just go there and um, make sure that you register so you don't miss out. And then, uh, yeah, so for those who have been asking, uh, like I mentioned in the beginning as well, that I'll be sharing a QR code uh, to scan and also a link. So if you can just uh, scan the QR code, ensure that you request your certificates of attendance. Uh, for those who are unable to um, scan, I'm just going to quickly uh, put the the link in the chat box so you can follow that link to to ensure that you request uh, your certificate of attendance. Okay. And then kindly know that you've got until Sunday, 10th of September, to ensure that you request your certificates of attendance. No further requests will be accepted after that. So please ensure that you do that as soon as you can. I'm just going to quickly put the link once again. So if you are unable to scan the QR code, you can just quickly uh, follow that link to uh, request your certificates. I think I saw a question on the chat. Now, how is oh, redundancy? Perfect. Yeah, how is redundancy handled in the process of extraction? Yes, I don't understand the way you put the question, but my understanding is that in case maybe there's a low reservoir production, how do you handle it? That's where we begin to do what we call a subsea processing. We have subsea pumping that we help us. So in the design, we put it everything there, or we do what we call water injection. So as soon as the, we, we, we reject the seawater, as soon as we separate the water, we reject it back to the well uh, for it to uh, improve the reservoir pressure. So that's how we can handle those things. OK, now somebody said, I have a question. Specifically, subsea technology x mastery horizontal. Now, what's the question? Is it that you want to know the difference between horizontal Christmas tree or uh, vertical Christmas tree? Now, let, if I do understand your question, horizontal Christmas tree is a Christmas tree that the tubing anger is oriented in the Christmas tree, while vertical Christmas tree, the tubing anger is within the well head. So that's the difference. Now, horizontal Christmas tree has an internal tree cap while vertical Christmas tree has external tree cap. Horizontal Christmas tree has a debris cap, 
while vertical Christmas tree does not have a debris scar. Horizontal Christmas tree does not have a master valve on the vertical condition, while or the vertical Christmas tree has valves in the vertical, orient in the vertical orientation. So I believe I'm able to do justice to that. Now, so can we have the slide, please? I think uh, Barry has already promised us that we're going to set up the slide and the recording. Now, can the number of the well be determined whether you are using a template or cluster manifold? Yes, it can be determined, but when you're using a template manifold, template manifold is a kind of manifold that the Christmas tree, the wells are drilled through the template manifold. So it's like you are putting all eggs in one basket. If anything goes wrong, it's a calamity. Now, while cluster manifold is just a small uh, proximity of like four or five words, just within for the each manifold, I just do it short, short, short. So the case, so depending on the uh, operator preference, the people that are doing the concept, they are thinking at that time, because human beings told me decide that because of technology, let's go for this. So that's what matters. So the number of words is determined by the reservoir engineers and then by with the flow assurance to determine, okay, how are we going to work and how many ways for the reservoir that we have? How many of the reserve, the reserve how, how many words do we need to get those reserve up? If you go and put uh, 10 words and you only need two words, that's going to be a big waste of money in the carpet. So I think that's uh, a bit clear. Another question again. That, thanks. My question is, how are the subsea set protected against the sea corrosion and the deterioration over the years? That's a good one. Now, if you look at the subsea Christmas that I showed you, you see it's been painted. So we use uh, the, we, we use the, we use coating plus cathodic protection against the corrosion and deterioration. And when we are doing cathodic protection design and the coating design, for the corrosion protection, that's the external protection now. We calculate based on number of years. How many years is the field life? It's going to be 20 years, 25 years. So you calculate the design field life based on cathodic protection and in combination with coating. So as the coating is deteriorating, as the, instead of the, where the Christmas tree or manifold or pipeline to be deteriorating, it is our cathodic protection that will be, that will be deteriorating. So that's how we guard against it over a period of time, depending on the design life. Good. So I'm based in Namibia. What do you think can be the best deployment method for Namibia? <laughs> I will say FPSO, because FPSO, if there's no if there's a problem, they sell it away. So in Africa, I think it's only we only have one spa, another one ETF in Africa. The rest is FPSO. So even in Australia, we all have FPSO. It's only when you get to the North Sea and the government of Mexico, you get to see SPA TLP. So I think for proving many years of experience and the applicable glacier of the FPSO is always the best. The riser, please, if you can define it again. Yes, just like the, the language riser, a pipeline that's supposed to be laid on the seabed is a pipeline. When you make it vertical, we call it a rising pipeline. So that is riser. So it's just the, a, a type of a pipeline that is angry, that is connecting the pipeline to the host where the oil will move. So the riser now is moving from the water to the outside world. So it's going through different. So that is riser as well. Yeah, thank you. Interesting and complicated. Thank you. Okay. Can I can I see? I won't have problem joining oil and gas industry. Yes. Oh, thanks a lot. I'm from IT field. Yes, you are welcome. We need you. We are talking of subsea control here. Yes, but sacrificial anode is very good. We have sacrificial anode for pipeline. We have the bracelet anode for manifold and the other the subsea structure. We have the standoff. Uh, standard standard, we have the flush mounted and material selection depending on the materials you want to use, whether you are using a corrosion resistant alloy or you are using a different kind of materials, zinc, indom, depending on what you are looking for, different kind of alloy or stainless steel, super triple steel. Then the second issue of the leakage, how is this prevented against to ensure the sea device is not pulled, polluted by the oil? Yes, that is done from the design. For example, 
the pipeline. That is when we begin to design the wall thickness of the pipeline to withstand the pressure, both the external pressure to avoid the collapse and the internal pressure to avoid burst, and then do a proper hydro test to avoid leakage. So all those will be checked. Okay, as we define compliance tower, compliant, not compliance, <laughs> but what compliance, that's the maybe another English name. Uh, you are giving it to it, that's Lazarus. So now we are talking of compliant riser, not tower. The compli where the tower comes is where we are talking of hybrid riser, where you have the flexible catenary riser connecting to a, a, a top tension riser with the help of a tower. Now, when you're talking of that's for tower, where the tower comes in now. Now, for the compliant, compliant means that it's moving the way the C wave is moving, it's compliant with the C movement. So we have the flexible riser, stick catenary riser, we have the lazy wave riser, the stiff wave riser, different kind of compliant riser. So that's why it's called compliant. So how do you conduct preventive maintenance on the manifold pumps? Yes, that, that's the plan maintenance. But at the same time, this is what going to be done during all the, everything will be checked during the design during the installation, before the installation, that's something we call subsistence integration system, uh, the subsistence integration testing. So all those tests will be done to make sure that everything is plug and play and okay before you go to the scene. Will the slide be shared? Yes. The commissioning procedure for a subsidy asset well, I have just explained to you, but it's not part of the scope today. That's another lecture, lecture you want us to talk about. Maybe we will take off the webinar next time. So we'll talk detail about the commissioning because that's where one of the areas that the whole world is trying to move to. So the, the commissioning, depending on what you are uh, decommissioning, if it is pipeline, you have to flush it, you have to do it and then plug it and then bury it, depending on the agreement with the government. If it is a uh, subsequent Christmas tree, or maybe manifold, that's some subsistence structure that you may not be able to remove from the sea forever, but they may tell you to rock dump it, depending on different kind of law. So that's the, so depending on the asset and different kind of law, depending on the nation and the applicable law. But there's no single uh, law now that is applicable for when it comes to the commission of subsidy. Even Australia, as we are advanced so much in Australia, the first subsidy commission is about to take place since the start of oil and gas, which is going to be completed by 2026. That's the first subsidy commissioning. Are there any advancement or trend in the subsidy industry? That's good. We have some new subsidy technology, but because of our time, maybe we will try to do it again. The new subsidy technology trends in the industry, that's where we begin to look at. We don't want to put anything at the top side again. We don't want to see FPS. We don't want to see tensional platform. We want to put everything on the seabed and just take it so we call it subsidy to beach. And then at the same time, all those processing that we are doing at the top side of APS, so we don't want to do it. We want to do the processing. That's why we call it subsidy processing, subsidy separation, subsidy data injection, uh, subsidy pumping. Everything is done on the seabed. That's the new level. Then some of the things we are looking at, all electric, uh, the, that's instead of using a uh, Christmas tree, I'm going to use on five, we want to use all electric. So we are going green. So what kind of materials you use in Christmas to prevent the pressure underwater? We have different kind of materials. Depending on the, we have the forged material, we have the zinc uh, alloy material, depending on the part of the body. So we have different types. Yes, I think Barry has already answered the table for five free certificate. So good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Jeremiah. Have a great afternoon, Feather. And thanks everyone for joining us. And uh, just feel free to um, send us an email should you have any suggestions or any feedback. Thank you. Thank you.